Okay, fine. Uh, buongiorno, guten tag, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time zone you are in. The thoughts I have today were uh, prompted by David Dvorkin's centenary talk about Michelson interferometry. And I asked myself the question, how many of the other great discoveries of the past century have required brand new technology? And the answer was all of them. So I then narrowed down to ones where the majority of the community said it couldn't be done, it wasn't worth being wasn't worth doing, but there was somebody out there who thought it was worth doing and worked hard at it for a long time. That's my three-pronged blivet. I'd never drawn a three-pronged blivet before, and it came out quite well, so I'm proud of my three-pronged blivet. Can we go to the next image, which is a list of things? Now, I want to say something about the Kordilevsky clouds, which is dust at the L4 and L5 positions in the Earth-Moon system, the lunar surface gravimeter and other detectors for gravitational radiation, the Kepler mission, mostly transiting exoplanets, but lots of other stuff, detection of solar neutrinos, the intensity interferometer, some things there won't be time for, but I want to say something about SETI and maybe detection of cosmological neutrinos. Because sometimes when they said it couldn't be done, it really couldn't be. The next image should be text about the Kordilevsky clouds. Conrad Kordilevsky, who died a few years ago, Polish astronomer, thought there should be stuff at the L4 and L5 positions. So he looked and he thought he'd seen them and not everybody agreed. And the next image is an IAU circular where he reported seeing the clouds and almost nobody believed it. What was needed was very impressive technology. What was needed was the Apollo program. And the next image should be a montage showing where L4 and L5 are. Kordelgevsky with a camera of his own, which is a very strange thing. I think he was a strange person. I met him only once very briefly. That's what his typewriter looked like. It has the Y and the Z in the East European rather than the West European position. That was what his camera looked like. And in the lower left-hand corner are the photographs of the Kordelevsky cloud taken from Apollo 15. Next, by the guy on the left, that's Al Warden, an astronaut from Apollo 15, very late in life. He died last year. And the report of the photometry from that lunar libration region. And I pulled that out because we have actually two tracers from Kordilevsky clouds to gravitational radiation. One is the lunar surface gravimeter, which you're going to see in half a second. The other is Larry Dunkelman, who was a childhood friend of Joseph Weber. He was just enough older than Joe that he heard Caruso sing for his fifth birthday present. The next image is the lunar surface gravimeter. It was built to turn the moon into a gravitational wave detector. It failed for reasons you'll hear in just a moment. But let's look at gravitational radiation and the possibilities. The next image should be a list of talks, topics, yes. Oh, sorry. This is the, this is te text, right? Apollo 15 to Apollo 17, basic design. It didn't work because Lacoste and Romberg didn't know that gravity is weaker on the moon than it is on Earth. How many of you already knew that gravity is weaker on the moon than it is on Earth? Everybody, yes? Okay, no feedback. <laughs> the next one is the image of the lunar surface gravimeter. And the one at the South Pole worked just fine because gravity at the South Pole is the gravity we know and love. On the moon, it simply turned itself into a seismometer, which they already had a bunch of. There were reflights scheduled for Apollo 18 and Apollo 19, which did not happen. Okay, next image, image nine, Julia. Um, is the gravitational wave text, Do, did, are there gravitational wave solutions to Einstein's equations? Yes, even Einstein admitted that. The uncertainty was whether they would carry energy if gravity was the only force in the world. That is, if you had you know, two point masses orbiting each other, and that was the only force, would they spin down from gravitational waves? And the answer is they do, of course. But this took a long time to establish, and nobody thought it was worth looking for except one person, Joseph Weber, you'll meet him in a minute, other good guys said it existed, Wheeler, Cowley, Landau, and Lifshitz, Girani, Bonnie, so forth, but they weren't prepared to do it. There were devices built to, from one person up to four to up to up to Godzillion. The first interferometer in the lab was built by Bob Forward, who'd been Joe's student at Hughes Aircraft in 1969. The next image should be a bunch of equations on the left. That's part of the problem. The, the arithmetic of gravitational radiation is very complicated. That's the simplest possible solution at the whole page. 
And on the right-hand side of that image is Joe's first design for a detector. It required two one-ton piezoelectric crystals. There are no one-ton piezoelectric crystals now, and there weren't certainly in the 60s. But you can find in the catalogs is a few ounce piezoelectric crystals. So the next image is Weber gluing, gluing small piezoelectric crystals on a big bar. And the next image after that, this is image 12, is Weber in the vacuum chamber with the disc, which was intended to look for violations of GR in favor of the brands dickey theory of gravity, which has a scalar part. The day after that picture was taken, the support collapsed. And if Joe had been there then, the controversies would have been much smaller and I would not have ever married him. Of course, I wouldn't have met him. Next is again, Joe in the detector. He didn't often go out in his skivvy shirt, but occasionally. Image 14 is the data tracing in the early days. It was an Easter line Angus chart paper recorder with red ink. I think that's noise because it doesn't have a threshold drawn. The next image is three guys from left to right there, Howie Laster, Joe Weber, and Hart Westerhout. Laster was chair of physics and Westerhout was chair of astronomy at the University of Maryland in 1969. And that was a press release day with a little tiny model of a bar detector in front of them. The next image, Weber realized quickly it was necessary to go to low temperatures. And this is an early design for a cryostat to do gravitational radiation detectors with bars at helium temperatures. The next image is an attempt to build a cryogenic detector at Argonne. The trouble with cryogenic detectors is every time something's wrong, you gotta warm it up, fix the thing and cool it down. And when your thing is a two ton bar, that warm up and cool down takes about a month. So you don't get to fix many problems per year. And they went over at one point to a helium dilution refrigerator work at, at millikelvin. That was even more difficult. Next is a small bar at the Smithsonian during a, an exhibit that, that marked the 100th birthday of Albert Einstein's 18, 1978. I think the bar is probably still there in a back closet with David Dvorkin's signature on it. The next image should be data for when it was computer done and not just Eastern Line Angus. And the, the trick was to do a, a, a coincidence experiment between, between two detectors with a threshold and you slid one detector tracing against the other to see if at zero time delay, there was more energy going into the bars than at other times. The answer was yes, there's the peak. And the next three images we can go through very quickly because they're the same picture three times, but with credit from John Wheeler, image 20. Image 21 is credit from Ray Weiss. Image 22 is credit from Kip Thorne that the field would not exist if it hadn't been for Weber. Perfectly true. But they said these in an obituary when he was no longer competing for funding. I'm glad Adela mentioned elephants in the living room because we're going to have an elephant at the end of this, a different elephant from hers, but nevertheless an elephant in the room. The next image is what became of some of the bars after Weber died. There they are, all corroded, standing on end in some random storeroom. They've been turned since into a Weber garden at the University of Maryland. And on his 100th birthday, somebody put 100 pinwheels around the garden. They sent me an image, but of course I couldn't process it. Image 24 is the Weber who had these ideas. That's in his mid 40s. He was a violation of the principle that people have their best ideas when they're very young. And the next one is my favorite picture of Joe Weber. That's from the 1970s sometime. I, I like that picture. That's the guy I married. We now go into the Kepler mission. Do we have Image 26, which is about the Kepler mission, it has a bunch of words. Do we agree which image we have, guys? Yeah. Anybody? Super, thank you. Um, he's, the Kepler mission was, again, very much one person who insisted on doing it when everybody else said, A, it can't be done, and B, it isn't worth doing. His name is Bill Baruki, William J. Baruki. I was in Poland, in the area that his family came from, when one of his prizes was announced. I'd actually nominated him for that prize, although I never met him. I still haven't met him. And I don't have an image of him either because there's a whole book about the Kepler mission and it doesn't have an image of, of Baruki in it anywhere. You'll see some other images. So the concept goes back to the 1980s, the launch in 2009, and they turned it off. They gave up in 2018. The idea was very, very high precision photometry to see the transit of planets across their stars. It worked. It required a 100 degree, square degree field of view and 10 part per million sensitivity. 
in addition to half of the exoplanets we've ever found, it sees AGNs, saw AGNs, supernovae, other transients, asteroids, comets, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, and thousands of transient exoplanets. The idea of looking for transits, well, Howell, who edited the book, credited somebody from early 1800s, but in fact, Goodrick and Piggott, when they studied Beta Lyrae, thought they were seeing a transit. Next. Yes. We don't have a picture of Baruki, so here are a bunch of people in bunny suits working on the Kepler mission at Ball Aerospace. I sent Bill an email saying I wanted to talk about the thing. I didn't have a picture of him. So he said, he sent back, he says, he was always willing to share an image with a friend. But of course, again, a technology, I couldn't, I couldn't process it, so I still don't have the picture. But there are the guys in the bunny suits. Image 28, that's an exoplanet and three kinds of false alarms. An eclipsing binary, a rotating star with spots, and a variable star. To other people, those are signal, but of course, if you're interested in exoplanets, those are noise. The next image, this is figure 4.2, Julia, yes. and it shows something mooning through the beam. I don't really understand it, but it doesn't matter. It's, oh, that, yeah, okay, that's, that's astro seismology. That's studying stars by their re resonant modes. And when you study a star carefully that way, you learn a lot. We learned, for instance, that the center of the sun really is helium-rich compared to the outside because of nuclear reactions. That was important in solar neutrinos, which we'll hit in a minute. And image 4.6, image 30, that's the inside structure of a white dwarf derived from helioseismology studies, astroseismology studies, stellar seismology studies of white dwarfs discovered by the Kepler mission. And while the surface is very, very thin layer of helium. The inside is mostly carbon and oxygen. And the ratio is interestingly different from the ratio of carbon and to oxygen in the solar system. Next, this is, this is, image, this is figure 5.4. That's just a bunch of rotation light curves of, of assorted asteroids. And the average period is 9.5 hours, which is longer than the average period of asteroids studied from the ground. So either you need to study asteroids from space, or you need a ring of telescopes all the way around the world. There's another of these odd, do it my way, and it's worth doing, and I'll use my own money if I have to. This has done that. His name is Wayne Rosen. He was the vice president of research at Google for a while, got a lot of money when Google went public. And he's built something called the Los Cumbres Observatory, which says, we keep you in the dark. Telescopes all the way around the world in North and South Hemisphere, so you can study things with long periods of variation. Next one is figure 6.10, image 32. That's the fastest probable supernova that's ever been seen. And again, that's noise if you're interested in exoplanets from Kepler, but signal if you're interested in supernovae from Kepler. The next one is spectra of an active galaxy before and after it ate a star. This is called tidal disruption event. A star gets too close to a black hole, it gets torn apart. If you get too close to a black hole, you too will be torn apart. It happens when you've been stretched by about 10%. There are data on this from the Middle Ages, how far you can stretch a person before it's too late to stop. That gets a laugh when there's, there are live people in the room. We're going to move on now to detection of solar neutrinos. This is words again, it's image 34. Pauli said he'd done the unforgivable. He postulated a particle. Nobody could see that particle ever. He wrote it in a letter to uh, Lisa Meitner. And Lisa Meitner is a whole study in herself, of course, of people who did not get Nobel Prizes. Pyrrhals and Beta said no way to observe neutrinos, so they should be coming from the sun. Beta and von Reisecker, yes, the sun makes lots of them. That was 1939, and then there was a war. 1951, Fred Reines went to Ray Bradbury, sorry, Norris Bradbury, who was then director at Los Alamos. He says, I think I see... I think I know a way to see the neutrinos coming out of a bomb. One of his colleagues told him, Jerome Kellogg, better to use a reactor. Fewer neutrinos, but it lasts a lot longer. You can study a reactor for a year. You can only study a bomb for a few seconds. So they failed at Hanford. They went to Savannah River. Cowan and Rhinus announced in 1956 that they had seen neutrinos coming out of the reactor. In fact, anti-neutrinos, it turns out. Rhinus went to Case. Cowan went to George Washington University and died in 1974. 1966, Rhinus and his team came to UC Irvine. They built the IMB detector, which saw supernova 1987A. I'm sitting on the fourth floor 
of a building called Frederick Rhinus Hall because Rhinus won a Nobel Prize and Irvine is rather proud of it. And I see out my window, quiet, a building named Sherry Rowland Hall because he won a Nobel Prize the same year for uh, getting rid of fluorocarbons. Okay, next, Ray Davis. This is text again. He spent World War II at Dugway. He, got, he went to Monsanto and then on to Brookhaven. He was told just to find something to work on. He picked neutrinos and worked on radiochemical detectors versus Rhinus and Cowan using scintillators. Ponte Corvo at Chalk River, Alvarez at Berkeley, Fowler and Cameron told Ray Davis to look for solar neutrinos and told the call to do a better calculation. They went to Savannah River again, to Brookhaven, and on to the Homestake Mine. December 1963, this is an honest story that I had from, from uh, Maurice Goldhaber himself, who was here at Irvine at once, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. He was director of Brookhaven. He noticed that what they said they could detect was a lot larger than the predicted flux, and suddenly the prediction went up and the detectable flux went down. So uh, Maurice Goldhaber committed some Brookhaven funds to trying to detect solar neutrinos, and it was Davis who built it. And his Davis Cavern in South Dakota was declared a historic site last year. Nobel to Davis, not to Bacall who did the theory, but he got the first Dan David Prize in 2003. Image 36, the digging starts. They figure out what they're going to have, what they're going to see. They invented the solar neutrino unit, which is 10 to minus 36 captures per second per chlorine nucleus. First data, they saw about a third of what the, the, the uh, theory predicted. Very worrisome. Ponte Corvo had suggested neutrino oscillations. That turned out to be the right answer. There was a conference on the, on the problem here at Irvine in 1972. And the right idea came from Mikheyev, Smirnov, and Lincoln Wolfenstein, which is neutrino oscillations. The next image should be a very young John McCall in the middle and a very young Ray Davis on the right. And the next image, which is 35, is a somewhat older Ray Davis standing over the Brookhaven financed lead South Dakota detector, you know, 100,000 gallons of perchloroethylene cleaning fluid. The first year they didn't see anything. And the tech, the tech people at the mine said, never mind, Dr. Davis, it's been a very cloudy year. Neutrinos are not stopped by clouds. Next image is early data, data from the Lee Davis detector. Um, and they were seeing about a third of what the predicted 10 SNU, 9 SNU prediction. They were seeing about, seeing about 3 SNU. And that brings us to the Irvine conference. I don't have a copy of the conference photo because I loaned it to go in a cabinet for Rhinus's celebration or something. But here's the front page of the cover. You can imagine what the conference photo looked like. 45 distinguished white males and one female, me. And that brings us to SETI. And ideas go back to the ancient Greeks. I have one Frank Drake story to tell, and we'll then flip very rapidly through the, the various telescopes. You all know that Arecibo collapsed. Summer of 1968, I happened to be in London, ran across Frank Drake there. He took me to the British Museum to see the Rosetta Stone and explained his interest in codes. He'd spent the Korean War on active duty in cryptography, and he thought the most interesting code to detect would be something prepared by an alien. And that was his goal in starting the first radio searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. Next image is, is a bunch of radio telescopes. The one that he used for OSMA, the one that the Russians used to see CTA 102 that they said was communicating. Of course, it wasn't. Next, we have, I think, more radio telescopes. We have some cartoons. Yep. This is, we have cartoons now, right? Okay. This is a Russian yep. mission landing on some other planet because the people by the tree have their horns. And the astronaut is running up saying, Miss, oh, Miss, for God's sake, stop. Mm -hmm. Don't pick the apple. <laughs> and the next one is more cartoons. This is, this is my all-time favorite cartoon. This is some sort of spacecraft a flying saucer, and it's crashed in the desert. And there's this poor little green extraterrestrial saying, ammonia, ammonia. And the other one is the Venusians landing at some conference. We now have 
the next two go through, just flip the next two. The Arecibo, healthy Arecibo dying, and they've cleaned it off, all the mess. Arecibo farewell in the Allen telescope. One more is 48. This is the VLA. And the question, are we alone? We still don't know the answer to that. I can't, it's not as fashionable as it was in the 60s and 70s, but image 50 is a book cover. That's what Penampa, Rumor, and Cameron thought an interstellar message should look like. Image 51. Yes. That's what Ronald Bracewell, a very distinguished radio astronomer, thought intelligent life would look like. It's a nice book, by the way. Intensity interferometry, I think I don't have time to say anything about. Except, again, most people said it couldn't be done. They didn't understand it, including George Abel, who was teaching at UCLA in those days. I must have understood it one time because I was hired to study it. But um, it turns out that adaptive optics and phase-preserving interferometry works better. Next, that's just a picture of the one guy who thought it was worth doing. That's Robert Hanbury Brown at the time he was president of the IAU. And it was he and his students who built the first intensity interferometers. I think we're going to have to skip detection of cosmological neutrinos. The next image is just words, but the problem is that the material costs about $30,000 euros a, a gram, and you need hundreds of grams, and there may not even be that much around. This brings me to a couple of last thoughts. The search from the elephant. This is the elephant. This is not a political elephant. This is the elephant in the living room. And so image 56 is a whole bunch of elephants. Image 57 is a few elephants. Image 58 is even fewer elephants. Image 59 is just one elephant. Her name was Misty, and I actually, I didn't meet Misty, but I, we had a friend in common whose name was Daryl Baker. And image 60, the last one, the real elephant of the room, that's a $20 piece of paper, an American $20 bill folded into the shape of an elephant. And funding has always been the elephant in the room for any of these ideas that one person thought was worth doing. Quite often in a shoestring. So there's a shoestring. And that lower right-hand corner. Joe Weber wasn't quite like anybody else in the world. If he broke a rubber band, he didn't throw it out. He tied the ends together and continued to use it. So that's a, that's a Weber rubber band. And that's the spirit, I think, that built the first detectors for solar neutrinos, the first detectors for gravitational radiation, the Kepler mission, the first attempts at SETI, and so forth. Danke schön, Mille Grazie, Tanan Vaga, and F. Carista, which is Greek for thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you very much, Julia. Was uh, Julia was yes. very <laughs> somebody, somebody somebody give Julia a martini. She's earned it. <laughs> sure, sure. It was incredibly <laughs> fast, and she was great. Uh, we have a comment by David the Working. I, I mean, uh, please remind that Virginia cannot read the chat. So it would be great if everybody can uh, can ask because it does. It's more a lively. Um, interaction, but uh, in David the working comments was that Paul Foreman was one of the curators who created the exhibit you mentioned. Yes, the device is the storage. Do you want to reply, yes. Virginia? Well, Bob, Bob Foreman is a wonderful guy. Um, he also wrote science fiction. And one of his things takes place on a neutron star where the main danger is an earthquake that he calls a Trimble Temblor. And if you can say Trimble Temblor three times in a row quickly, you're, you haven't had your martini yet. Um, Forward was also one of the two witnesses when Joe and I married in synagogue in May of 1972. We'd been married by the county clerk in March, and we thought we should have a proper wedding where we could feed our friends and all that. Um, and Bob Forward was one of Joe's two witnesses for that event. Only men could be witnesses, of course, for that kind of an event. Now, I was uh, my comment was only to give credit to Paul Foreman, uh, who. Um, uh, stuck to his guns and made sure that the uh, uh, the detector was prominently displayed as an oh, important okay, sorry. part of the history yes. of the program. Another, another fine fellow whose track record is mostly in x-rays, isn't it? Paul Foreman? Yeah. No, no, he's, uh, he's a retired uh, uh, curator of the history of physics 
uh, from the National Museum of American History. Oh, okay. Um, there's another yeah. foreman in astronomy. Oh, of course. Yeah, he just won an award. Y yes, okay. I'm sorry. I simply got, got hold of totally the wrong person. But you know what it is? We have a hell of a lot of wonderful colleagues, don't we? Absolutely. Okay, there is a question by Adele Ladad. Maybe Adele, can you can you ask your question yourself? Sure. Which is better for? Uh... Sure. Uh, very appreciated the elephant in the room, Virginia. I totally agree with the last image. Thank you so much for your <laughs> <laughs> for your very vivid pictures from uh, for your research. <laughs> Uh, I wish to make a question that is not really connected to your talk, but to your experience as a scientist, uh, very uh, interested and keen to history of science. Um, I, I wish to, uh, to learn your point of view on the role that the history of astrophysics and astronomy, history of science in general, can have in the education of future scientists. And what is your experience about it? Do reflecting on and analyzing the history of one's own field of research make better scientists? Let me start by quoting Richard Feynman, who said that history of physics was as much used to physicists as ornithology is to birds. But you understand it's ornithology that gets a bird declared endangered and saves the life of the species. So ornithology is useful to birds. History of physics is useful to physicists. Um, the late Wall Sargent, of Caltech and Mount Palomar said that a field was dying when it started taking an interest in its own history. I think that's clearly not true. It becomes a separate discipline, history of science. As for student education, there are two schools of thought. And I'm not possibly the worst teacher UC Irvine ever had, but I always rank near the bottom when the students evaluate their professors. And it's because I like to tell stories. And it always turns out at the end of the semester that there are five students who say that hearing history told as stories is the best thing that happened to them all semester. And there are 20 who said, don't tell us stories, tell us how to get an A on the exam. So 20% of our students like history of science. I think that's probably enough to keep us alive. Does that kind of answer your question or not? Absolutely, That's that was a really wonderful answer. Thank you. So uh, I you. see in the hand raised by mm, Daniel Kanefik, there is time for a very short question and a short reply. Uh, oh, thank you, Roberto. Well, uh, the question then is, uh, you've mentioned the, the long delay time with the cryogenic bar because it takes a month to cool it, heat it up and cool it down again. And I was struck by problems in the history of doing the Einstein uh, light deflection prediction at eclipses because of course you might decide you could have done your experiment better but your next opportunity is at another eclipse some years hence and so i was wondering if this uh lead time that the, the time taken to be able to rerun your experiment and learn from what you did the previous time is more or less what defines the rate of uh, progress in a given uh, experimental science would you think that's probably true i think it's probably true and it's not just experimental science when i was a little boy Computing was done at a computing center. And in the morning, you took your box of cards. And in the afternoon, you picked up your printout. And you couldn't take another box of cards until the next morning. So you had at least 12 hours to think about what you'd done wrong last time. Now people do their own programming on their own laptops. And they can run at 12 wrong simulations in 15 minutes. And there's no time to think between. And the time to think between I suspect is very important for theorists as well as for experimenters because indeed the eclipse light deflection got much better in the 20s, right? This is your territory. Yes, yes. You know, I think you're absolutely right too about the about the computing differences. Yeah, I agree. It's not maybe just an experiment, is it? On, on the other hand, if, if you have to wait, but, okay, this is another good one. The next Perry, the next Perry, whatever it is, of that star around Sagittarius A star is 18 years in the future. And that's too long to have to wait between looking for gravitational redshift and quadrupole moment. It would be nice to have that again in about two years. So there's sometimes when it's too long between opportunities. Thank you very much. I think that we can close here. Thank you again, Virginia, for being